Hey, now welcome back to Stitch Gang the Tour. Here we are, uh, part four. I totally Sponsored forgot. By what... Legal Lean. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to get my sample in the mail so I can pour up. <laughs> pour up? I think that's how you have to say it, too. You have to say, oh, pour, I, I'm pouring up pour... Legal Lean. I cannot wait to pour up. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we're going over we're going through our first non-rap release uh but i thought it was appropriate because it seems like rap adjacent which is number one angel by charlie xcx and she's written for rappers we were talking about how she wrote fancy for one of the best rappers which is iggy azalea mm-hmm, mm-hmm. she's so fancy she's still around is she still putting out like a little some stuff? Yeah, she just put out an EP actually. Um, I saw a video, I saw a music video, and uh, I watched it for very uh, obvious reasons. But um, she still sounds as black as ever. <laughs> uh, so next week we're going over that EP. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna dedicate an hour and a half to an EP by Iggy Azalea. Yeah, yeah, we should make it longer than the last show. In <laughs> issues of appropriation, yes. well, uh, we can talk about we'll we'll talk about Hoodie Allen, Eminem, and uh, I don't know somebody else. Who's uh, who is the booty booty rocking everywhere guy? Bubba Sparks. We can do Bubba Sparks too. Why not? So uh, this was my first time really listening to Charlie XCX, but you were a fan before, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I had seen somebody post the video for Nuclear Seasons back in 2011. So, I mean, I, and I dug it, and I was waiting for an album, and it seems, you know, it seems like the album delays are something she endures quite often, So because she didn't have her first, like, LP come out until 2013. Uh, it was called True Romance. Which was a which is a relatively good album. I really dug it, and mm-hmm. uh, after that, I didn't honestly kind of stop paying attention. But the songs I did hear from Sucker were actually pretty decent. I know Boom Clap was a pretty good, pretty big song. Yeah, I, I listened to that, and I and I I was like, I know the song. <laughs> um, <laughs> apparently, uh, Hillary Duff rejected it, and then or oh. her people rejected it, and then. When Hilary Duff heard that, she was very disappointed. Obviously, obviously, she would still she could still be relevant, right? Yeah, that would. I I I don't know anything from her actual comeback album. So, did she? Uh, I know. Well, she had to have put out an album if they had yeah, to reject I mean, songs. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I can't even think of anything. Two weeks I can't from think now, Hilary Duff's comeback album. <laughs> So we've got we're lining it all up. Maybe we could put her on the Iggy Azalea episode as well. Oh yeah, we could just do um white women episode. I was gonna say white rap white female rapper, but she's not a rapper. White um, artist. How about that? We can do it like a Christmas special. <laughs> a white Christmas special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of people who may not listen to her regularly are most likely familiar with her. Because of songs like Fancy and Icona Icona Pops, I love it, which I cannot stand, but you know. It it was a ridiculously huge song for a minute there. Right. I, I mean what I, I listened to that today and when I was looking over her songwriting history, because she's been she's been writing since uh she was fourteen and releasing stuff and then signed to a label and then does a lot of songwriting has those two albums to her name and now this mixtape, which I, I think the reason for it is that her label was um, delaying the release of her album. So she just kind of went rogue and made this with uh, with A.G. Cook and a couple other tracks with other people and just put it out. Yeah, and it seems like that's just more or less the trend. And I, I, read, a, I read a brief article that more or less brought into... The nature of the, uh, I guess, the major label business and album delays and what have you. And I, I, is she still on a major label? I mean, it sounds like it. And um, I know I read in a few articles I've read that her her album was supposed to come out earlier this year, 
and I haven't heard any rumblings about a potential release date that may fall anywhere within the calendar year. Yeah, this one says the mixtape is on Asylum. I think that's I think that's the label that's delaying it, and her previous album was on Asylum too. So. Um, and there was a and there was a bit of a hubbub about all that shit too, because I know a, a lot of people complained about it, like being a quote unquote mixtape, but uh, her label still charging for it, which is. But I, from what I understand, it's only like five dollars, and you know we'll get into it later. But I feel like it it, it could be well worth it. I mean, they're the songs that are really good. And why would people complain about that? It's like I. I've never. I I just stream it on Spotify. Oh well, uh, this is a Spotify premium privilege again, actually, because I do. Oh, wow. Someone pays ten dollars for my Spotify, so. Well, I'm actually looking into getting Spotify premium. <laughs> there you so, go. There we go. So maybe I, I will It'll be able to be enjoy a, this. An expense for the show, you know. <laughs> I'll put it on the corporate card. Yeah. So actually, I was at a party last night, and someone told me about. A.G. Cook's notes for this album. Um, he's a PC music guy. So I went to look at those, and they're, they're pretty good. What, what did you think? Yeah, I thought it was really good. I mean, it gives you a nice look into the creative process of one of the main producers of the record. And it's, I mean, and this and this type of stuff is what I like to read when it comes to getting more of an idea as to how the album comes together. And it gives you a better appreciation of it. Also made me look at some other stuff for context. So I li- like listened to Uffy, and I listened to Kesha. He mentions Kesha. I listened to one Spice Girls song. I forget which one of the, I think Baby Girl is probably the most the most Spice Girls influenced track. So yeah, um, yeah, I was listening to Kesha. I was listening to TikTok, which is basically a rap song, but and it's so bad, but it it's kind of it's the same sound for as a lot of number one angel songs Mm -hmm. and a lot of the same kind of um, playing with uh, black slang and rap tropes. Um, But just for like much dumber people, like this is like the version for hipsters and it sounds really good. And it's (laughs) kind of, it's weird. It's not just like meant for like Mm -hmm. mass consumption. It, it, It comes from listening to a lot of, rap music instead of coming from listening to rap music on the radio and saying let's make a version of this with a white girl singing and rapping i suppose it's just kesha's really bad i actually remember listening to that album that had tiktok on it and uh, i remember there being like a few songs that i would just joke about the context with my friends and I mean, I guess it make that, that makes sense. I'm just, I just hate that song so much because I used to wake <laughs> up, I used to wake up to the local like pop slash rap station when I would go to work and I would hear it like every morning, almost like clockwork. And I'm just really sick of it. I don't care about, I doubt that's what waking up like P. Diddy feels like. I just fucking <laughs> I don't know. I feel like she, she should get a little, she should get some credit. I don't know. I I guess I could out of pity. She's she seems like she's gone through a lot in her life. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah. Just out of because of what happened, we should give her some credit for mm-hmm. somehow mm-hmm. years later giving us this album which yeah, so I like that. Yeah, it, it starts like for for me that stuff starts with uh, the first track which is uh Dreamer. You know, Dream I'm a Dreamer, stab stab out the beamer. Not that like people not that pop songs can't be about cars, but I feel like that's a, a thing that's owned by rappers. Um, and then uh, Stara has a verse on here, and she's talking about uh, cars, too. Actually, hearing Stara's verse made me think that she should be a ghostwriter for Drake. And then it actually turns out she wrote Fake Love, so she already does that. <laughs> but I just heard, like, oh, this is cool. Like, I feel like people <laughs> really like this if Drake was sing- were singing it. Um, is she British, Stara? I, I Stara? Forgot. No, no. I think she's from Philly. I want to say she's from Philly. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, yeah. After after you, I saw her on the track list because I, I can't remember after. I think I want to say I started really following her after I found out she wrote "Pick Up the Phone" by Travis Scott and Young Thug because, and then I had read a lot about her songwriting past. She actually, I think she actually recently put out like a a project on SoundCloud. If you haven't heard it yet, 
you should check it out. I mean, I, it may not be like sh- the strongest material she's got, but I mean, she's still, she definitely has a knack. I saw that she wrote a, Jer- a Jeremiah song and, and unfortunately she doesn't have involvement, at least noted involvement on the track, but blame it on you has like something of a similar flow to a Jeremiah song, I believe on planes. I think that's the song I'm thinking of like the flow and blame it on you is definitely reminiscent of Jeremiah's verses on planes. But I'm getting ahead. I'm Ooh. getting ahead. I'm getting ahead, though. Oh, no. we don't. I mean, we don't have to go track by track. But, you know, one thing I thought about when listening to this track and mainly every other track that had a feature on it um, was the Pitchfork review I read for this, which I read in preparation to, I guess, to more or less set, uh, set the tone for my exploration of this album going forward. And what one of the things it notes, especially in like a sub headline in the in the review, is that her performance, her being Charlie XCX, is often overshadowed and upstaged by the features, um, which I think is a little bit unfair. But in this particular instance on Dreamer, it's not necessarily that she's being like upstaged or overshadowed, but I think it's just the features are more or less um in the limelight because there's just an absence of Charlie XCX outside of the, the chorus and maybe like a, like a post chorus somewhere down the line. But I mean, overall, I think, I, I feel like, I think that's wrong. Yeah. I think, mm-hmm. I mean, on, on this one, the, the features are great, but I mean, most of the tracks are solo tracks. So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, and I feel like on the, on the last one, they kind of give the song to cupcake um, yeah, yeah. There are a few there yeah, I think I feel like this like I feel like Dreamer and Lip Gloss more or less they I feel like they could have been billed as like a like a cupcake featuring Charlie XCX mm-hmm. song. But I mean outside of those two, I feel like the rest I mean they're just it's just an absence of Charlie on these tracks, so I feel like that's pretty unfair. I mean, considering that, you know, she's responsible for a lot of really good hooks on this entire entire mixtape so it's just like i don't understand where that's coming from oh my god pitchfork gave it 6.3 what the fuck (laughs) this is like my favorite thing of this year my favorite record i have to read that i haven't read it but uh no i mean i don't think she's out i mean you can have a track where the where the guest shines but it's you know in the service of overall service of the song like uh, i think it's a pretty great song um beyond the the stara feature um on uh on drugs the abra feature is really good but it's also just it's also part of the song and i feel like i you know the all the Charlie uh, parts are really memorable. Yeah, and I feel um, honestly, I I feel like having Ab- Abra on that track is like very fitting, considering you know the uh, lyrical content on a lot of her records and a lot of the uh, artists associated with Awful Records. And um, I mean, and honestly, actually, you know, in that particular instance on drugs, I feel Abra, her performance might actually maybe upstage charlie's and that it seems a little bit more involved and introspective and you can actually take a lot of her verse you know literally or metaphorically i think it's just there's like there's a lot of dual meanings in that particular song and i actually enjoyed it more than i thought i would i mean i think at first i wasn't like too hip to it just because i mean well i'm not a big fan of abra but she definitely has some tracks but i think it's a definite fit there for sure Uh, are, are a lot of her songs about drugs you mean? Um, I think a few of them are. The ones I have heard are, but I, are you familiar with uh, Awful Records? No. The label? And well, it's like uh, Where Father Is and Slug Christ. Stuff like that. I mean, it's it's not really good, to be honest with you. But <laughs> I know they were they were a big thing in 2014. Yeah, I remember, I remember when Father was pretty big. No, yeah. I mean, I like Charlie on that. Like, yeah. Yeah, like I said, it's not like she's like super upstage, but I mean, I think comparatively, Abra's verse is a little bit more meaningful. But overall, I mean, the the hook's great, and it's I can't really say a whole lot of negative things about it. Um, so one thing I was thinking of throughout this is, can like 
Charlie sing? Is she a good singer? Because I, I, I feel like most of it is her doing, um, trying to do like virtuoso vocal stylings and changing it up and doing like, you know, different shifts. But then sometimes I'm like, oh man, as someone who like is really into singing, singing, they mm-hmm. would listen to this and think it's awful. You know, like the people who their favorite song on 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 Lemonade is the you know the piano piano ballad about um, Jay Z cheating on Beyonce because it's, it's like oh she's really singing you know wow um, <laughs> I feel like those singing people wouldn't like this but like I loved all most of the vocals on here. Well, I feel like uh, emotional is a pretty good representation of her range, kind of. I mean, that's one of the more, like, ballady songs on the record. Um, but as far as, like, you know, pushing pushing the uh, boundaries and te- really testing her range, you're right. You know, there aren't any standout examples of her really being able to just belt out a note. I, I mean, I think the, the stuff she does with autotune on, on here is amazing. Uh, I blame it on you. That one had like amazing auto tune. I, I mean, when you combine auto tune with an actual singing ability, it's it's kind of crazy. Like when it's not just a when it's not a tool that makes it makes you sound like you're singing. Or mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I've been listening to too much like Young Thug and Rich Homie. You've been Paul listening to too much but... Travis Scott, man. Yeah, like I I feel like the gymnastics she was doing are are just. I feel like that's a lot of what she was trying to do throughout was just um, do as many different vocal styles. There's a one where, there's one where she does go in, she goes into like kind of a, a jazz, kind of like a, a, a raspy singing voice. Oh yeah, uh, 3 a.m. pull up. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, because there's like a soft break, right? There's a silent break where she sings mm-hmm. on her own. She goes into sort of a jazz kind of, loungy kind of voice mm-hmm. and as like just of a change up for like the end of a verse it's really great yeah that's well that song overall that's like one of my favorite on the tape but that that overall has a lot of like really strong dynamics going on mm-hmm. um yeah especially especially lyrically when you think about the the last chorus and how the lyrical changes more or less change the dynamic the, dyna- the dynamic of the entire song um mm-hmm. and overall it's just a great fucking song it's really really upbeat um the chorus is great. Yeah, the uh, the holding on, holding on refrain seems really hard to. I mean, that's a, like holding on, holding on, holding on, holding on. Like it's like a lot mm-hmm. of uh, a lot of effort to like hold on to those syllables and, and pull up. <laughs> no is pun like intended. A, kind of a <laughs> yeah, um, right. Uh, pull up is like a hard thing to say. Mm-hmm. She kind of just tries to you know put that in as much as she can and just like hit hit those words as hard as she can mm-hmm. yeah this this the record's mixed kind of weird too like i cuz when when i went to listen to other stuff it just seemed louder and kind of um a little more um tinny than other stuff um well, do you, a... do you like other mm-hmm. go ahead well that's just like the nature of uh the pc music collective you know uh especially especially with Sophie who who produced Roll With Me. I mean, if you've listened to any of Sophie's solo tracks like like Lemonade or anything on her, um, the last release she put that was put out as sort of a compilation, that's more or less like the, the trademark. It's like real tinny, kind of bass heavy and like a lot of like low frequency keyboards, like super bass heavy. And so that um, might that might actually do it. That might explain why. Because they see it all. See it always seems a little bit more full on tracks that they have a, a hand in producing. Do you? Uh, were you a, a big fan of the PC Music crew? Oh, I'm a, I'm not completely familiar with um, the entire crew as a, as a whole, but I've definitely um, I definitely enjoy a lot of Sophie's productions, um, which was. Which was and it was really nice to hear a Sophie produce beat on the latest Vince Staples record, which is like my one of my favorite tracks on that record because I mean I feel like in that Sophie's work works a lot in that particular realm, and even then it still had that like trademark uh, like pitch shifted super high vocals in the chorus and 
like it like it's as a, as almost a, a layer that somewhat contributes to the track so you kind of know what when a sophie track is a sophie track um <clears throat> So I in 2014 or so, I was in love with Hannah Diamond and Attachment specifically. And Pink and Blue was pretty good too. And then I forgot about the whole crew. Then when I started listening to this, I loved it. And then I did my research and I found out that it was PC Music and AG mm-hmm. Cook. And it totally makes sense. And I was so glad to have this sound back in my life. If anything, what I feel like this record is... It's an owning of the the sound that they tried out on the Vroom Vroom EP that came out prior to this release. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I was curious because it's Sophie Productions, so obviously it's like you know putting together two people whose work I enjoy. And um, it wasn't it wasn't terrible, but it it definitely felt like there were still kinks to be worked out. And um, I I you know I applauded the effort you know as they tried to do something a little bit different, you know, it was like pop music, but, you know, rooted in this somewhat forward thinking production, like setup. And, um, I feel like this, they've managed to create something of a balance and I'm super curious to like hear what comes of, uh, further collaborations as they sort of, uh, you know, nail down exactly what they're trying to do. Yeah, I wonder if they made, if if Charlie, I wonder what she's doing for her album. I wonder mm-hmm. if this is just kind of, you know, it's called a, it, they, they're calling it a mixtape. I mean, you know, I mean, to the consumer, uh, at the consumer end, there's really no difference between a mixtape and an album these days, except like one has a, a publicity push behind it and the other one is kind of, you know, might be like dropped on you out of nowhere. And, and in the case of rap, uh, albums have more high profile features but um i wonder if all the kind of all the kind of like rap moves you know like like they had the like three six mafia type chance on pull up and uh charlie xcx does the kind of like self id especially on the on the on the last track you know it's oh, yeah. charlie baby it's charlie mm-hmm. which is like it's weird like you only hear rappers like call them you know uh, well i know you know you know um it happens in in pop too, but I feel like that's more of a. I feel like I identify that with rap, you know, saying your name all over and over. So I wonder if that's the direction she's moving in, or if this is just kind of a a, a thing she does as a throwaway kind of experiment. Yeah, I haven't I haven't listened to any of her singles that she's released recently either. I think she's got a song called Bo- Yeah, she's called she's released a single called boys and then she did another one with lil yachty and i uh i didn't listen to that either oh yeah and she has a song with french montana oh really <laughs> yeah are you sure you're not mistaking that for the uh that uh the uh, ain't worried about nothing remix with miley cyrus are you sure that's not what you're thinking of? <laughs> No, no, it's, it's called Dirty Sexy Money. Ooh. Yeah. Scandalous. And you know what? One thing I noticed about the lyrical content on this release, too, is that it seems like far more mature as well. And mature yeah. in a sense that she may have grown, but also in that she's a, she's a little bit of a dirty bird, honestly. Mm. And um, it might be like the cupcake influence on <laughs> lip gloss because cupcake is a, is a real dirty bird, but she's also like super clever with her wordplay yeah. and um she fucking owns it i think for for lip gloss the one thing i did manage to write was cupcake in all caps <laughs> um yeah i mean in terms of like lyricism um you know like emotional mm-hmm. uh blame it on you like i those those songs are kind of you know the feelings are so big um they're not they're not like the deepest i don't know i feel like there's no with this sound like there's no there's no really attachment to i mean even more so than in pop generally because i i feel like people go for authenticity but Mm. um i feel like the whole pose of like the pc music crew is is a sort of like a divestment from authenticity you know they're just it's basically you know just um fan service of of pop music they grew up listening to and like warping of that 
Um, and A.G. Cook's notes, actually, he, he says that he doesn't do drugs when he was talking yeah. about uh, drugs. <laughs> he was like, music is my drug, actually. Yeah, that's for uh, but, drugs. But, you know, you still, yeah. yeah, that's for the song drugs. <laughs> but, you still, but you still write, you know, you still write that because, because that's what, you know, you write about. <laughs> it's all like, <laughs> you can, they kind of, um, I mean, A.G. Cook in his notes talks about just making these epic songs and he he kind of um very self-consciously talks about the moves that he that he uses to to make things feel epic so it's kind of a meta thing where you kind of feel they're 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 putting in these like musical moves and this reverb and large choruses to make you feel emotional but at the same time they know that you know you're being manipulated so you're listening and you know that they know that you know and it's <laughs> and it makes and uh it makes for just a very shallow interaction but fun <laughs> it's always nice to have something like this and i feel like this is the escape that i often look for when i go to enjoy pop yeah. music so i mean i think coming from you know the the hardcore punk realm you know especially from like politically charged like crust punk like anarcho shit that i've enjoyed i feel like that was always something that i needed it was almost always a requirement so you know when it comes to stuff like this you know i don't i don't mind it i mean i feel like it's it's not necessarily a requirement for me to necessarily be so so much engaged as it is in other you know right because the the self-expression is not in the lyrics or the content it's. I mean, I think in. If, I feel like in this one, it's mostly in the vocal stylings. I feel like that's where Charlie XCX tried to put most of her her effort. So yeah, um, what would you say is your favorite track? I love you too. And in the notes, I noted that it's uh it's not produced by A. G. Cook. It's actually produced by mm-hmm. Danny Harl. And so you know, I I did it a little bit of digging, and he's you know he hasn't produced a lot of tracks, but he uh, the superfruit songs he did, which are members of that uh, a cappella group, the Pentatonics, mm-hmm. I think it is. I, I can't remember if that's how I say it, but he's produced like some tracks for them, and it has more or less the same feel from like a super like pop perspective. It's a, it's a really it's a really great song, and there are like keyboard guitars that I find a, a bit cheesy, but it really adds a, it adds a little bit of depth and little bit of a spice to the chorus itself they they recalled sleigh bells a little too much for me though i did like the solo at the end the solo was fucking awesome yeah and it's not like uh something it's not like a a a guitar strum Mm -hmm. that i i hate hearing in in pop songs like as a background noise like i think uh (laughs) an example that comes to mind is a i can't i wish i could remember the name of the grime song but it's a grime song that has like strumming guitar in the background, and it sounds like some fucking like yeah. Kelly Clarkson shit. And I, I yeah, I like this song because it, it has kind of the uh, the verses are kind of they're kind of like dead eyed and a little on the slow side, and then the the chorus comes in and and it's mm-hmm. huge, um, <laughs> yeah, and the guitars oh, come in and now. it's just like kind of uh, it's kind of like what I was talking about, like where it's like nakedly just trying to like elicit like these emotions out of out of nowhere in a in a like kind of way that that's absurd um yeah i like that one too probably the one that i um yeah it's a, oh, you, no you go ahead go ahead well i was just going to mention really quick that it's a pretty pretty good balance of uh a lot of charlie's older material and the the new direction that she's taken in teaming up with PC music. And if all of the tracks continue to be something like this or like a variation of this, then I'm, I, you know, you'd be, pump, be pretty you, pumped you on You wouldn't it. think she sold out like a lot of the, uh, the fans. Oh, fuck. No. I mean, no, I don't give a shit. I mean, like, I don't, I don't, especially like, like, like I was saying earlier, when it comes to the pop music, I don't care about selling out or anything like that i mean at the end of the day if you can write a really good song that will stay stuck in my head then you yeah know, I, was, so be I was looking like whenever you look up her videos it's like oh i miss this charlie she sold out but it's like the videos she put out like three years ago so i wonder what those people what their reaction to number one angel would be they'd probably 
have an aneurysm. Yeah, it's really weird because like it seems like a lot of the focus that I I noticed on this particular project was just that she was dealing with an album delay and that, you know, that was more or less mm-hmm. the nature of her yeah, career that, and that was more the narrative. And that coupled with people thinking the features were a little bit more interesting. That's a more or less what I read. I, I don't think that one was fair. Well, so next week you want to do that uh the Chris Brown marathon? Yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? I could spend my I can spend my Thanksgiving <laughs> week and weekend exploring the uh <laughs> sick twisted mind of Chris Brown. Uh yeah, so next week we're going to listen to the Heartbreak on a Full Moon album live. That way, I mean, because it would be impossible to prep for this because how many times can we listen to a two and a half hour album? So I don't think we could do an actual, like, a show in our usual format. I just can't imagine what it's <laughs> going to be like having to listen to all that. Uh-huh. Because, I mean, when in listening to something like this Charlie XCX project and, like, the little Lil Pump project that we talked about i mean those are both relatively relatively short so i you know i felt okay with dedicating my time to it but this chris brown thing is going to be a real real doozy we'll do that and then two weeks from now we'll do the um, we'll do a a book review on the autobiography of gucci main i'm hoping in that book i get confirmation that fit skinny gucci is indeed a clone (laughs) i'll be looking for that one (laughs) That'll be the twist at the end. And I think we'll have the legal lean for that one, so we'll we'll be sipping on legal lean with it. Which won't make us fat and constipated like real lean. Yeah. I can't wait to pour up. Alright, we'll see you next 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 week to Stitch Stitch Gang Nation. Yeah. Happy happy turkey day. <laughs> <laughs>